Welcome uh, to you all to our Spring 2021 Metropolitan College Distinguished Lecture. Uh, thank you for joining. It's a pleasure to see everybody. Well, I don't quite see you, but I know you're there. And I'm looking at the chat and thank you for the greetings. Um, the topic is COVID, the disruptor. We all are all too familiar, unfortunately, with what is happening. Um, I'm Tanya Zlatova, uh, Dean of Metropolitan College, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker and alumni of Boston University Metropolitan College, Cynthia Cohen. She's the founder and chief strategist of Impact 2040. That tells you already it's She's looking into the future. And this is a new type, a new breed of strategic consulting company uh, that takes a holistic approach to the needs of the client and provides support through the full business cycle, um, not piecemeal, from ideation to scaling, um, for reaching a profitable growth. Cynthia is a leading authority on consumer trends and strategic marketing, including brand positioning, digital marketing, e-commerce, market intelligence, business strategy. And what is amazing with her is that she always is so open and curious to learn and see and track every new trend. Earlier in her career, she was a partner in management consulting at Deloitte. Today, her clients range from global Fortune 100 companies to fast track startups. She serves on the boards of public and private companies, a variety of them. I took a look, thought I mentioned some, but the, the list is just too long. Um, Cynthia has been indefatigable in explaining and promoting the benefits of having women in leadership position and that that is a side of her that is so consistent and so generous and um, doesn't have an immediate business benefit is just the understanding and the warmth and encouragement she um, extends to everybody who is struggling um, she has steadily supported career advancement and professional development for women, both in the business world and also in academia. Her advice is blunt and her advice is caring. And I'm fortunate that I have been often the beneficiary of that and hope for many years to come. At Boston University, Cynthia has been and remains a force of nature, a force for bold change. She's a member of the Board of Trustees. She finds time to serve on the Met College Advisory Board, not that she needs it or that she has too much time. We appreciate that. She mentors students from Innovate at BU, supports the Innovation Pathway, uh, pathway and introduced the Cynthia Cohen Endowed Scholarship for Young Women Business Leaders. She recently co-chaired President Brown's Alumni Relation Task Force and there too it was change for the benefit of the community. Ms. Cohen is frequent speaker on emerging strategic challenges. She has guest lectured at Harvard Business School, Wharton, Babson. She wrote quarterly updates on business implications during COVID. And she gave presentation um, and talks uh, at Amazon, Florida uh, chapter of the National Association of Corporate Directors. And uh, those are just the ones 
that pop up that look more significant um, or rather not necessarily more significant but larger uh, because the significance is also in her work with people who struggle with uh, with communities who need help uh, and um, the, the results show. So today she will speak to us on one of the most pressing topics of the day. How do we reestablish a normal or at least as close to a normal as possible to our old rhythm before the COVID disruption? Uh, before I turn it over to Cynthia, I would like to ask you uh, to use the Q&A section, the question and answer section uh, for um, typing in questions uh, preferred. Uh, we are monitoring both the chat and in Q&A, uh, but the Q&A would be better. Uh, our Director of Alumni Relation, Catherine Moran, uh, is going to um, track the questions and so will I. Um, we have uh, expert technical help from our EdTech engineer, Mike Graciano, and also our uh, graduate student assistant, Samantha Phillips, is helping with um, tracking your questions. So we'll make sure that everybody gets an answer, hopefully here, uh, but if not, follow up. And with this, Cynthia, the floor is yours. So first of all, let me welcome everyone, those that are live and those that are going to watch this on Stream VU down the road. So Dean, thank you so much for inviting me to bring people into my work cave here and talk about what I've been researching, the companies and consumers and employees I've been talking to while we stay in place, Coco and I, and work from where we are. So the subject tonight is indeed COVID the disruptor. Now, next, and the new normal. But I wanna start out with a couple of examples to really hone in on the impact of what we're gonna talk about tonight. And in 1977, those of you that have been in Massachusetts for a while may remember Ken Olson, a real innovator who brought us the mini computer. But in 77, Ken said, there's no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. Hmm. In early 2020, we said, oh, grandma's never gonna buy her groceries online. Well, both were wrong. But here's the difference. Ken was wrong by about a decade because it took about a decade to have personal computers start to invade the homes of the United States. It took less than six months for grandma, abuela, nona, bubby, Gigi, to order her groceries online and maybe even go to the drive-through and have them loaded up in her car. She's there, along with so many other things that have changed and been revolutionized in only six months and a year. And that change was absolutely driven by this blow up of the business world, the educational world as everything went online and our personal world as we knew it from COVID that hit March, 2020. Here we sit in March, 2021. And we should all pause a little bit and take note and we made it through. We achieved this unbelievable devastation and eruption in our lives, work, home, and social, and here we sit, and we're coming out of it. But, but, we still have not gotten to the new normal. 
And I'm gonna talk more about exactly what that is. Here's how I look at it over uh, calendarization. We spent most of 2020 just adapting, figuring out how to quickly make all of these changes. We were highly reactive. And now in 2021, and it is because the vaccines are coming out and people are getting vaccinated and the numbers are going down. We're going into not new normal, but next normal. And for those fashionistas that are out there, you see in this middle section of the chart, it's going ombre, meaning from very dark to light. And I did that purposely because we're going to come out of the darkness, but not quite get to the full light of new normal and do it gradually. So we're still coming out. We're in a what's here and now, not quite into full next normal, but let's talk a little more about what that means. So where we have been is many, many pods. And pods are what we define as our safety zones. And safety has been in the eye of the beholder. There is no universal meaning for safety. It means we've associated ourselves in our pod with people that share our values. And so we have an office pod and a school pod and a friend pod and a neighborhood pod that we felt safe in however that meant to be around and we huddled with them, either digitally or physically or in a hybrid. We are now moving out of that, but we're moving now into anxiety, confusion, trial of things, and we are also saying, and consumers really don't like this, we, we kind of like predictability. So we're saying, what is safe? And as much as I want to go out, oh my God, you know, I kind of like this filter on my face. People are going to see my wrinkles and we got to get out of the sweatpants. But really? I don't know that I'm ready for that yet. And I put shoes on. You don't know that I'm really sitting here barefoot. And oh, by the way, the number one thing that everybody wants to do is go to a restaurant. That's true across all generations. But we also kind of like these little huts that are up here where like we have our own little private dining rooms outside. That's kind of cool. So there's a lot of question marks about what we feel comfortable doing. And again, these value systems are not universal. They are in the eye of the individual family, the individual consumer, and what they perceive as safe. From a business perspective, there's probably a major decision point as we get from the now truly into the next normal where we have some predictability. And that probably is sometime this summer. And again, it is driven by vaccine distribution. And of course, what happens with the variants? Now there are plenty of people at BU who can tell you all about the health issues, the variants, and I'm not one of those people from BU. I'm here just to talk about the implications on business. But I've read the news like everybody else. And so it's looking like sometime in the, the summer time frame, businesses are going to start to make decisions on when to return to work and also to start scheduling things. Nobody feels comfortable right now booking a block of rooms for their annual sales meeting in Dallas. They just don't know when things are going to be fully opened up, when we're going to go to the conferences. Should we book a room for South by Southwest next March? 
That's still a consideration of whether it will be physical. They announced new dates, didn't say whether it would be physical or not yet. So here we sit and we are just approaching the next normal. We're coming out of this addiction. And at this point, I really wanna talk about the consumer side of things. And what I mean by addiction is, boy, all that was coffee and carbs and salt and alcohol has just like enveloped us and made us feel so good to get through all of this. But now we're saying, okay, pay the piper and it's time to get healthy. Oh, and it's also time to fit in those high heels, those tailored pants and change how we dress. One of the very interesting things that we are just starting to see is a little bit of FOMO going on for those that have left the cities and saying, ooh, did I make the right choice? I upped and moved to the suburbs. Should I have done that? Or should I stay in this house? Does it really work for me now that I've been here 24 seven, live, work and social? Is there something better out there? We're gonna see some peaks that are relatively artificial as people overcompensate. One of the things that people may overcompensate on and we're seeing early indications of is looking for new jobs because I didn't want to look for a new job while all of this was going on. There was reliability in where I worked. There was reliability in that I was safe at home and I wasn't risking anything. And I didn't get on a plane to go do an interview. But it also means reskilling. And a lot of people are gonna jump at reskilling. There's also going to be a segment, and this will skew towards the older generation, who will say, you know, it's been nice. I did not have young kids in the house. I did not have to do homeschooling. I had my work cave, but I don't want to go back to the office. So I'm taking early retirement. So we're going to see some peaks of job movement some peaks of early retirement as people make these decisions. And life change decisions are always triggers to change brand loyalties. And that's gonna happen as well. But the thing that we all recognize is the overwhelming mental health issues that we have to deal with as a result of COVID. And feelings, and perceptions are reality for a lot of people. And there are some feelings of inequity out there. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Recent survey was done of people that have been working from home and who said they had had a promotion. 34% of men said, I got a promotion during this period of time. Do you know what women said? Only 9% of women said they got a promotion during this COVID time on work from home. We also know a lot of women have left the workforce and they're feeling higher stress levels and they are feeling that it is unequal. Lots of conversation and news reports about that. We're gonna have to deal with that as we move into new normal. But here's the good news. People have not been spending all of their disposable income. And this is obviously not true because there hasn't been a lot of disposable income at the bottom end of the socioeconomic ranks. But with the government supplements now, it is going to be woohoo where people are going to be spending again spending what they've been saving by not going out to eat, by not buying apparel. But what is this going to cause? A peak, an artificial peak. And the reason I keep coming back to that artificial peak, you will see as we talk about how we predict the products of the future.
But let's talk for a minute about the business perspective in the next normal. And you see here a picture of a movie that I absolutely love, which is all about Eve. And this line that Betty Davis has in the movie, I think is so appropriate of how business is looking at what we are gonna go through in 2021. And I'll do my best imitation of the side eye as Betty looks and says, fasten your seat belts. It's gonna be a bumpy night. Well, business, fasten your seat belts. It's gonna be a bumpy year. Again, we don't know the predictability. So in all cases, we have to make hybrid work. And what that means is react fast. Take a page out of the startup manual, pivot, pivot, pivot. You've been reimagining the physical things of offices and stores and conferences. You've got to start to implement those things and continue all of the innovation, most especially the product innovation, because the cycle of innovation was getting shorter. It is highly compressed now. The expectation is bigger that new things will come to market and you will be responsible for the market demand. Find new partners is a mantra. You're gonna have to find new vendors. There are new strategic relationships and some of your competitors may be your new partner in this environment. But the one most important thing that business has to remember is all things were not created equal in this last COVID year. Hasn't been equal for our employees, hasn't been equal for our vendors, hasn't been equal for our customers. There are a lot of people hurting and we have to continue to display empathy and social responsibility because that's what our customers wanna know. Where does the company stand on the issues that are critical to me as your customer? So there are some things that are good that have happened and will continue to happen in new normal. So as we look to the future, what are the holdovers coming out of next normal? Well, hybrid's gonna be a holdover. There is no question Somebody like William Sonoma has said, we're a digital first company and we're going to stay that way, even though we're going to have stores. And I think that they'll continue to do this hybrid model. Yes, they'll get back to doing store events, but the virtual has worked so incredibly well. Their strategic relationships with celebrities and influencers. And as you see here, when they combine Jennifer Garden and everybody's favorite, Ina Garten, together on Ina's book tour, that was a huge success. Why would you walk away from things that work and that you know will work in the new normal? A lot of environments were unsafe for people. We put robots in. Well, those robots are gonna save. A lot of those jobs are not coming back. Yes, robots are in our life. They're in our workplace and that absolutely will continue into the new normal. As everybody went online for education, all of that distance learning, a lot of it is still gonna stick as people look to reskill, as they come out of this COVID year and we're in the next normal and you still have all of those avocations, the collecting, the research that you've done, the new language you learned, the games that you've played and learned how to do that you've all done online, you're gonna continue to learn online whether it's masterclass, because I'm just interested in these things, 
and I want to hear what Anna Wintour has to say, or you're going to get a certificate from MET in cyber, you're going to continue to do a lot of it online and online education is only going to get better. The other thing is we've been very connected on a variety of platforms. We've communicated synchronously and asynchronously. We've collaborated and that's not going away. It will happen even more. You see the newest social platform Clubhouse on there and there's more coming like Clubhouse. As people move to the synchronous, come back to verbal, kind of stop screaming at each other on social platforms and really have conversations. So I don't know exactly what new normal is going to be, but I know it's not really gonna happen in fall of 2021. We may stop giving vaccines at Gillette Stadium, but we're not going to fill it up in the fall for the football game. You may watch the Boston Ballet Nutcracker in December of 2021, but there's not going to be a family sitting right next to you in 2021. And we know today that people can't really plan the conferences and the typical business things that they do in a year. There's not enough time to get them done in 2021. So that's why I say true norm normal will happen in 2022. And what we are seeing in this new normal, because the disruption is not going to stop. These changes are not going to stop. The evolution of the environment is going to continue at a very rapid pace, such that this last year has been like a war. And what we're seeing now and what we will see is like what people saw at the end of World War II, where there was incredible change in employment. There was change in where and how people lived and a housing boom to build houses that address the way people want to live at the end of World War II. We're going to see that again with a housing boom, with the design of the house is different because the way people want to live in their house, since they've been there the whole time, is now different. The thing we have to remember is we are global citizens. And we're also living among 50 states. There's going to be an uneven recovery. Not everyone is going to enter new normal at the same time. The recovery of the economy, the change in behaviors, how business reacts is going to be different by geography, by consumer segment by industry, and we're all going to have to deal with continued international turmoil. And that really does affect us, it affects our supply chains, it affects so many things about our lives, as we've seen what happened with this horrible pandemic that started on a global scale. There are things that happen by generation and you say, where were you when? And it becomes a line in the sand. Well, COVID is clearly one of those. You know, if anybody's ever looked for apartments in New York, they have a saying of, oh, I want a pre-war or I want post-war. Well, we're gonna say, did that happen before COVID? Or I want one of those houses that was built after COVID because it's more sustainable and it has better energy efficiency and it's got detection devices and better air quality and air handling machinery in it. 
everything will become, was that before COVID or was that after COVID? Because there are big differences. So I'm here to answer the existential question of what happened with toilet paper. Well, I'm using toilet paper as an example because everybody asked the question, why was there no toilet paper before COVID? It's because our supply chains were so finely tuned. We were doing lean manufacturing. We had great predictive intelligence. Even if there was a hurricane, Walmart knew how much extra toilet paper and batteries and coffee and Lysol to have stocked up to send to the hurricane region. But we never had what amounted to a hurricane in every single community simultaneously. The entire lean manufacturing supply chain could not have predicted this. And so consequently, we paid the price of empty shelves of toilet paper. After COVID, we're gonna work on agility. We're gonna be able to change things on a dime because by the way, our data history for 20 and 21 is not gonna be predictive for 22. So we have to be agile with our manufacturing and supply chains. Now, businesses have always been a world of acronyms. We've talked about EPS. If anybody is on an audit committee, we were talking about SOX 404, you know that. After COVID, we're gonna be talking about ESG, DEI, NFT, ERG. And I'm not gonna tell you what any of those mean if you don't know. I'm gonna give you a little bounce, what we call in retail a bounce back. Go to my LinkedIn tomorrow. I will post these slides and I will post the meaning of each one of those acronyms. Before COVID, we talked about interactions with people, with our customers. Yes, we talked about relationships, but after COVID, we have really learned the power of community. And we are gonna build stronger relationships with all of our stakeholders and emphasize community. Business has never been seeking to do harm. In most cases, they weren't purposefully doing harm to the environment to their employees. And the mantra was do no harm. It was embedded in the culture. After COVID, after last summer, the fall, everything that has happened, it is now, you just need to do more good. Not because you're mandated to, but because you should. You have a responsibility. You're part of the community. Just because you're in business and a corporation doesn't mean you're not a citizen of our community. Do more good. We spent a lot of time, a lot of data analytics collecting customer intelligence. That was pretty good, except it didn't help with the toilet paper. But other than that, it helped with our Netflix suggestions and our Amazon suggestions. And that was great. After COVID, data privacy. There is a major movement around personal advertising and collecting data so that you can do personal advertising. And that's my data and I own it, you don't. And we're gonna hear a lot more about that in the future. So we're going to start to define the world in before COVID and after COVID. And the things that define the after COVID are the things that I've listed here. Now, as far as consumers are concerned, the big thing is 
work from home. And I'm gonna be a little contrarian here. Look at these pictures, think about this. Is this really what you wanna keep doing? Really? Yes, I know. Some people went out, they bought those little micro houses and they put them in the backyard and that became my work cave and that was really wonderful. And not everybody has school age children. Some people have their parents living with them now. Most especially the younger population wants to go back to work. And we also know that biologically we are made up to re require personal interaction. We need the personal energy. So is it this or is it this on the right hand side? That's on the bottom, the VF Corporation that built that campus be actually before COVID. And at the top is a picture of the new Amazon campus going on in Maryland. And so these new campuses, these new office environments, I may not want to be there five days a week, but this is going to be a good place to go back to because we do indeed need that personal energy. So in the new normal, consumers are going to choose the time, the place, and the mode of how they operate. Their brand experience and the corporate values that a brand has is going to count on their brand selection. Now, I think everybody in the audience understands what their oxygen level means. We've learned a lot about our healthcare. There's going to be a device boom in healthcare on our wrist. And oh, by the way, the new toilet we buy too is going to have detection devices in it. And yes, we are going to have robots in the home, Ken Olson. Even though you're not here anymore, there will be robots in addition to the personal computers. A demand for a real revolution in re residential design because we know what we want to live in now. We've been pretty food obsessed. So we're focused on food quality and the source of where our food comes from. And we adopted a lot of pets. Love me, love my dog, my cat. I may even bring my goldfish to work now but they have proven to be a boon to the mental health as we go through this and we're not giving them up. And oh, by the way, a big industry, the pet supply and pet care industry is absolutely booming. From a business perspective in the new normal, yes, there's work from home, but you're gonna find some structures and policies around that. There will be businesses that will do more around the shared economy because we put that on hold. We weren't exactly going to share our car and maybe we got off Airbnb, but boy, the sharing economy is going to come roaring back and include equipment. The other big thing you're going to find businesses doing is really upgrading their in-house studios because video in every aspect of what we do, how we market, how we train our people, how we communicate, there's a lot of video that is being developed and will continue to be developed. Sustainability in all things, in our products, taking away excess packaging, what things are made out of, how we build, our offices inside and out. Businesses are also recognizing the power of the stakeholder and need to respect it, and many have. It's not just about the shareholder, but the stakeholders of employees and vendors. They will rehire, but the rehiring is gonna be very different and not the same quantity of employees that they had, unless they have exponential growth. 
So we are going to see a jobless recovery. And there will be new jobs, but they will require new skills. Both government and businesses recognize the importance of open spaces now, both inside our buildings and outside. And this is all a really good thing. So there's lots of silver linings here. And what I wanna leave you with is, okay, so I've prognosticated here. I said we're in next normal, which is not new normal. And this is what I think new normal is gonna look like. But whatever it is, there are some things that today you can do to be better prepared for new normal whenever it comes. And the number one thing, because we're all implementing AI in every aspect of our life, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And the thing that you have to remember is it is built on human beings making some decisions and setting parameters that then the computers can do using data that we've collected. Well, the human beings have biases we found out that get baked in. And the data we collected for the last year and for this year is going to be all skewed, ups and downs, peaks and valleys. So we've got to build better AI. Talked about mental health. I talked about that not all recoveries are equal in the economy, by geography, by industry. We really have to empathize deliver empathy and inclusion into our culture at the office, how we deal with our employees, how we deal with our vendors, how we deal with our customers. I say many times to my clients to talk about their clients in terms of empathy, walk in their shoes empathize with what they have gone through in this last year. That's got to come through in your communications, including your marketing. Number three, you need to take a talent inventory because the world has changed. The skills that we need are different. And I know I talk a lot about AI, but it is so incredibly pervasive and if you're going to have AI in your business, those decisions you are asking systems to make should have an ethical component to them. We need ethicists in our business environment as part of our talent pool. So increasing the skill level in ethics in data science is pretty obvious. Data privacy and whether it's the IT people or the attorneys that start to learn about data ownership, both from a regulatory standpoint as well as a cultural standpoint. Obviously, cybersecurity is never ending now. You never solve the problem. You just deal with the next new problem. And then lastly, we're gonna hire community moderators so that on social media, it's not all screaming. And as we build these communities, and I will say, whether you like Clubhouse or not, the advantage is the moderators. And we are learning that moderators help the conversation and the community build be more constructive. I also encourage you to look at every single thing you do, the products you develop, the environment that you have, the way you deliver services to your customers to consider experiential. We have to up the game in experiential, whether it's the user experience online or the physical experience walking into the lobby of a building or the physical experience 
of shopping in a store. Experiential is the word that you have to implement. And lastly, make some opportunistic investments. You really do need to spend money in R&D. This is a buyer's market in commercial real estate. Renting space, buying space, now is the time to do it. And lastly, women have been significantly disadvantaged during COVID. And many of them have left the workforce. And what an opportunity cost for the world. There is such untapped potential. Go back, hire back the women. And by the way, if they don't have the STEM skills, give them to them. Do the in-house education because there is untapped potential there and it's huge, just right for business improvement. So I'm pretty optimistic. I think there's a lot of silver linings. We're coming out a, a horrific year. COVID really and truly was a disruptor, but let's look at the good things that have come out of that disruption. That's how I looked at it. And I appreciate your staying with me through the end of this presentation. I hope you have some good questions. I'd love to engage with you more, have a little community conversation so I will be on Clubhouse. Look for me, follow me, and you'll see when we schedule something. I'm going to be on this new social platform brought to you me, from a BU student called Go Off. Tomorrow, my slides will be on LinkedIn, and I'm sure you'll be able to get them through BU as well. And Coco and I will be back on the road. So follow her Instagram because she's certainly tired of being home and has FOMO. So follow our Instagrams, follow our Twitter, and let's go to some questions. Thank you so much for spending the time with me and listening to me tonight. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn this back over to Tanya and to Catherine. There are a good number of uh, questions in the um, in the Q&A and some comments. So um, I'll let um, Cynthia answer most of them and I can chime in uh, whenever there is a view perspective. Well, I have, I have a personal question if you think we're actually going back to tailored pants is one of my real questions. <laughs> um, but we can set that aside. And um, we have a couple questions from Linda Holt who has two part questions. How does BU encourage students to come back to the ground? And her second question was she was on the Red Sox site today and there were a lot of tickets remaining even at 12% capacity. And when might we go back to normal? Definition of safety, but Tanya, you wanna take the student question? The student question, uh, well, uh, right now, we have given the students the option to either be basically to choose where they are at any time of the semester, uh, whether to come to class, whether to stay at home, uh, to change that mode uh, during any time of the semester. And we have been in that modality um, fall and spring, and we'll remain in that modality in the summer. What have we observed? Well, um, it has worked very well to retain students. So that is a, a clear success. And um, uniformly, I, I worry because I'm not in the classroom and I, I worry how students are adapting to that. Uh, and uh, across the board faculty is telling me that they are doing their work, coming to class, but, and here is the but, um, fewer are coming to class. So um, one, one um, constant that has been 
and that is hard on our faculty. We have asked them to be in class regardless of whether there are or there are no students. So whenever there was a possibility to get them back physically, um, they had that. And that has come. Uh, faculty has uh, changed the way they, they teach in that they have some experiences in the class and some discussions that, that, are, um, that are better done in class. And um, that has helped. Uh, I have to say though, candidly, that in the spring semester, as it was so cold and so dark and such a long time in COVID, uh, that attendance has um, decreased substantially. So that, that's not what we are, uh, what we want to do. We are going yeah, to, go, yeah, uh, this in the, in the very aggressively encouraging them with activities in the classroom to, uh, to come. And then in fall, we are fully back in the classroom. It, we are not in LFA, barring of course some health emergency. Cynthia? Yeah, what I was going to say that I've noticed from the students that I talk to is that although they may not be in the classroom, they're on campus. And it goes back to what I was saying about the personal energy and that that's what people have missed is people want to be back in an active environment. They want, even if they have to sit outside and have coffee in a coat, that's okay. We've learned to eat in coats. We're being very European, like sitting out in the cafes of uh, Paris or the piazzas of Rome, where we're eating in coats and we're socializing in parks um, over a hot coffee and because we want that personal energy. And so the younger generation, because, and this gets back to, them also wanting to go into the office, they're living in smaller places, sharing with roommates, and they need the outdoor space, and they need the activities, and they need that socialization. So the college years are such learning years, not just for the educational content, but for also that socialization and networking that still happens physically. And all of the collaboration sites that we use are wonderful, but there's something about the alchemy of the personal energy all in a conference room or in a space together working that just transcends the digital world. You got to do it physically. Catherine, next question. The GI Bill was a major factor in providing the means to purchase housing. Ditto with education. The current recovery money doesn't match those numbers. Will this continue to separate the haves and have nots? Yes, there is going to be continued separation in haves and have nots. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the bill just passed by Congress, um, and I don't know everything that's in it, but that certainly is supposed to help in certain areas certainly in the healthcare area, the haves and the have nots. Um, when I talk about housing, it may not be investing more, but trading what you have for something that is more optimal, even in the same price point. But for a large percentage of the population, they have saved more in the last year than in more than a decade. So that money can go to buying things or into housing or even into a graduate education degree. Increasingly, higher education, academia is coming up with solutions of affordable, accessible education. So that this price differential that is very pronounced, especially um, in the US is decreasing and there will be much broader opportunities uh, and much more flexibility for education. 
And, and I just want to go back to the really lower end of the workforce. And what I mean by lower end is the restaurant workers and the cleaners and all of those types of blue collar jobs, many of which will be reduced permanently. Um, the growth of ghost kitchens as, and people just reduce the number of servers in a restaurant. Uh, the way hotel rooms get cleaned using robotics now with fewer human beings. Those are all job losses that are permanent. The other types of cleaning and monitoring that was done by human beings that's now being done by equipment. Those are lost jobs. And the new jobs are mostly in the skill area. And that's something that we as an economy have to deal with. How can businesses address empathy and social responsibility in relation to COVID-19 related social related racial unrest as epitomized over the summer in the killing of George Floyd and the more recent in anti-Asian acts of hatred and violence? Well, one of the things that I frequently talk about is in the moment marketing. And I know dealing with social things shouldn't be marketing, but when you do in the moment marketing, which means you take advantage of what's going on at this moment in time, and you communicate that to your target market. Well, that's true of the social issues that you wanna make a statement about. You use your marketing channels and you develop communications that are for in the moment. And so right now, if you look at their websites, if you look at their social media, the progressive companies, the ones that are really socially responsible have made statements, for instance, about the issues that are going on with the Asian population. And they have made positive statements about allyship with their Asian customers, employees, all of their stakeholders. And so communicating that allyship, the way you communicate other marketing messages in all of those same channels is really important. And when you miss the mark, your customers know it. There are a couple of Super Bowl commercials that if you remember, kind of missed the mark of the times. Aside from more robots, what predictions do you have about what new things consumers will expect in terms of fashion, retail, and industrial design? And are we in for a world of athleisure? No, no, we're not. And I will answer both of you. Um, Kirsten and Catherine, no, you can wear dresses. It's not all about pants. As a matter of fact, what I said, artificial peak, there is going to be most, especially with the younger population um, that has not been overwhelmed by the teaching at home and all of the issues that COVID has brought the more complex family environments. Um, there is going to be boom times to getting dressed up and going out and buying things, apparel, but still the ultimate volume is not going to be that high. I think that, as I said, you know, grandma, abuela, bubby, they're buying online now. Everybody is buying online. All categories of goods after COVID. So the choices are more plentiful. Um, there are many, many new entrants into the market in terms of retailers. Uh, so the offerings are out there. And I think that we are gonna see uh, a lot more fashion as we roll into really 2022. I, I think fall may still be a little subdued, but in terms of going bright and lively, and um, mm -hmm. we also have new ways of doing fashion shows. They've become very democratized now. 
It's not just the celebrity sitting in the front row. When you do it virtually, everybody's attending the fashion show and they've gotten really, really creative in these last two seasons. So there's advancement in fashion and then a favorite of, and I'll speak to the ones that I know that are on this uh, Zoom, a uh, favorite of ours is the kitchen and all the appliances and there's new colors in KitchenAid and new gadgets coming along. Um, so I think that innovation is in all consumer products. And let me not forget the cosmetic industry that is also has been seeing a boom in a lot of areas and will continue to see a boom as people care much more about the sustainability and the ingredients of the products, the packaging of the products, and the micro-targeting of the use of the products. So there's a lot out there and there's been a tremendous amount of innovation in cosmetics that we will see. We have a question from Scott Simonis. Hi, Scott. What is the new normal for our politics and government for example, larger social welfare state to address inequities and provide safety net for the jobless recovery? I'm not the best equipped to answer that question. Um, I'm not gonna get into prognostication of the political environment other than to say the awareness has been out there today more than ever before of the inequities in our society. And there are major DEI efforts, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the numbers speak for themselves. When you look at the number of people and most especially children that are food insecure, and then when you look at startups and you look at women and minorities, underrepresented minorities and founders in their access to capital. And I'm ashamed to say that the amount of venture capital money that went into women owned businesses in 2020 was less than 2019. So the facts are out there and if you're an optimist, I think you have to believe that the government private partnership is going to attempt to solve some of these inequities. I'm considerate of time, so we have a couple more questions. Uh, this one from Jennifer. Communities of color have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. How can and should our new normal strategies reflect this? Well, I'll go back to what I just said. I think it is a government plus business partnership to deal with the inequities. Um, the facts are there. The advantage is, and that's why I say in after COVID, we have to do more good, not just not do harm. Businesses, I think, have woken up or they're being forced to wake up and say, we have an obligation to do something for the community that we exist in, not just our employees, go beyond the employees. And we've got to do good. And that's how I think we're gonna solve some of the problems and, and make some things better over time. But I think you're going to see a major change in the business community stepping up. From Loredana, Met College has been very effective in its online learning opportunities for many years before COVID. How is the new normal going to leverage this strategic advantage? I think that's a Tanya question. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, it already has benefited us enormously. Because for us, the transition to uh, remote and then to uh, learning from anywhere was relatively easy. And we have now what has coming out of two 
semester, three semesters of COVID. In a, a much richer um, content for, for classes, practically all our classes uh, have recordings, have online materials. So that allows us to offer more hybrid classes and um, with the history consistently, as many of you know, for eight years, we our online programs have been consistently in the top 10 in the nation by US News and World Report, which is uh, about as rigorous a, a, a ranking there is. Um, we are seeing an increase in the uh, applicants, um, an increase in people wanting that to take a course that remain with us. I expect that this is going to continue, not just because of COVID, but because of the uh, changing structure of the workforce that um, Cynthia um, noted already, there is a clear shift towards the higher end uh, of the educational scale. The jobs are there for people who have college level education. And because, and, and also shifting towards the quantitative, computer science, data science, business analytics, applied analytics, uh, data analytics, and that is not going to, to change either because this is the, the changing nature of the economy that requires that education for being able to do the job. So there is a hollowing out in the middle of the job spectrum um, and that means more education. And of course the pace is not slower, um, it's faster, which then means that it, there will be emerging fields that require new knowledge. So people are going to have to go back to school. Thankfully, many people long, uh, live longer and they'll have the privilege to learn longer. There is a good side to it. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Uh, question from Carolina. Could you kindly clarify if the upcoming opportunities in real estate are going to be for buying or selling? Uh, on the commercial side, the opportunities are to sign leases at lower rental rates because there's so much vacancy. As offices have cut back, they've given up leases, as retailers have closed so many stores that the frothiness of all of those real estate rates before COVID is gone. And then after COVID, there's more hungry landlords to do deals, either to sell their properties or to do lower rentals. The residential market's very different. On the residential side, it's a very mixed bag, depending upon whether you're very urban and old uh, buildings or suburban or vacation homes. And in some areas, it's a seller's market of get money over your asking price because a lot of deals are uh, happening that way. So the, the, the residential real estate market is very localized and harder to predict. The last question comes from Graciela. How will partnerships between academia and industry be shaped in the new normal? Uh, well, on the research side, it is going to, these partnerships are going to accelerate and intensify. Um, they have been always there. So that uh, is um, not something that is terribly new. Uh, it will continue, it will also accelerate. On the educational side, it hasn't been, there, was, there wasn't that much um, overlap or even collaboration between industry and, uh, and academia. With the changing economy and with the fact that the tools for jobs are developed by industry and industry has an increasing sector of research, um, education will 
the, the, the ties I expect will be much, uh, much closer. And uh, 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 definitely in terms of skills, tools, um, industry um, developed approaches, um, there will be uh, academia is going to borrow from industry. And because we don't have the time to develop all this and, we, and, and faculty doesn't have the time to continuously uh, look and learn just a new, new product, which probably is uh, conceptually is pretty much the same as the older one, but it's more elegant and more efficient. So this is where we would like to lean on industry and to get their input and to get uh, them involved in education. And I want to add to that with a little bit of an advertisement for alumni relations at BU, because there's been this incredible opportunity um, that we really didn't have before COVID with Stream BU and all of the webinars that have taken place for our alums to understand more about the capabilities and what's coming out of BU in terms of intellectual uh, capital and really relevant information to how people live and what they do for work. And it may not be coming from the college you graduated from, and it's coming from places that BU was just implemented, like the Center for Anti-Racism, uh, what's coming out of Innovate, what's coming out of uh, computing and data science. Um, so I think there's gonna be a big spurt from our alumni to connect the businesses they work for or that they own and run with the university in a variety of new areas to fund, to collaborate on, to hire students, to give internships, and to be mentors. In the chat uh, from an international student, I, uh, student, I believe, are there opportunities for international students a little easier now than before it met? And um, the answer is our doors have always been open and we welcome everybody. And we do our very best to make, make to help you uh, come to campus uh, or enroll in a remote or online course before you can come to campus to, um, to really experience and work with us. Now, the site, the part that, that, that is out, outside our control is of course um, the health situation, the global health situation, and also visa regulation and travel restrictions that, uh, that the countries, um, that different countries have different regulations, obviously. Um, we believe uh, that uh, the backlog in uh, consulates with visa and application uh, is going to be addressed now more uh, better and quicker as the situation comes back to normal. And um, again, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that this will change and um, we'll do everything to help you along the way. Thank you, Tani and Cynthia, Cynthia for your time. Um, do I don't think we have further open question, which is a miracle, but we are way over time, of course. <laughs> right. So uh, I'm prepared. Oh, and I think everybody should end okay. with a toast. You made it through a year and go forth and have a cocktail and a good dinner or whatever time zone you're in. Maybe you're having breakfast, but here's to you. Cheers. Thank you again. And thank you, Dean. All, all the best to everybody. And with this, I think we can close the session. <laughs>